welcome back. And also in the breakfast, we serve you off the press, which is the newspaper review, where we take a look at the national dailies, dissect it, and try to make sense of it as much as time will allow us. As always on this show, time is always tight. I won't be alone uh, to do this with me this morning. In studio is still David Hondain. Good to still have you here. All right, so we have a couple of papers this morning, but we will begin with the Punch newspaper. And it will oh, already display. Thank you to our production crew there. And it says six power plants uh, shot in 35 hours, generation uh, slums. That story is on page 24, I believe. Um, debt servicing gobs uh, 1.57 trillion naira in six months. ShopRite battles $10 million judgment debt, barred from transferring assets. That story is on page 19. We also have Nigerian traders uh, must pay uh, $1 million, I believe, as fee, Ghana in seats. That story is also on page 6. And then we have the big story for the Punch newspaper. Mixed reaction persists. Concern is as uh, the West African Senior Certificates ex examinations begins today. Oh, good luck to them. Uh, the story is on page two. Parents lament additional financial burden, coronavirus charges. Wow. Provide PPE for yourselves if government fails. NUT tells teachers. How good or bad is that? The story is there on the front page. It's on page two. We have picture stories as well of, I believe, teachers who are trying to get into the school premises there. We also have Ondo Deputy Governor picks uh, Mimiko's ex aide as rodding mate. Our story is on page 12. Apologize, the characters are not legible. 17 appeal courts uh, sit to become vacant. All right. Last for me, U.S. agency kicks as Kano court uh, jails a 13 year old boy for 10 years. And we have hoodlums defy Amotekum, abduct two men in Ondo. That happened actually a day after the launch. That's so daring of them, if you like. We have police nab seven for cloning SIM cards to empty deceased accounts. That story is on pages four and five of the Punch newspaper. How cruel can that be? And finally, please declare manhunt as detained or your serial killer escapes. That's the 19 year old. You're wondering how did that happen? How did he escape uh, from the prisons? Uh, that story is inside the punch newspaper i will now hand over to you david i'm wondering there seem to be so many stories on the punch newspaper where do you want to begin which one rather do you want to begin with um i think we've already covered the the ghanaian story yes. on the news so let's move on to something else let's start with um, the story about debt servicing mm -hmm. let's look at the figures really so debt servicing gulps 1.57 trillion in six months. In six months, which I believe is roughly a quarter mm -hmm. of Nigeria's annual federal government budget. Mm. And I believe that that figure is still is still quite is still understated. I, I think that that figure only. You think so? You think it could be more? Yeah, it is more. That figure only covers external debt servicing. Nigeria also has a huge internal debt burden, That's which correct. never gets captured by the figures for some reason. Um, in fact, I believe it was, um, it was the former CEO of Amcon, um, Mustafa Chikobi, he said a few, few weeks ago that if you were to add the total external and internal, internal. debt of Nigeria, it actually exceeds Nigeria's annual income. It would be interesting to find out so, why we never capture the internal uh, debt service. Well, I mean, because the, you know, basically internal debt is basically, for lack of, of, of a better term, contractors, mm -hmm. project contractors who can be owed indefinitely. It doesn't really affect the fiscal position of the government as such. Mm -hmm. But the external uh, creditors, then there's a problem because if you default on that debt, then you have a real problem. So obviously they are the priority. And ultimately, we're going to need to have that conversation about the fact that Nigeria is, uh, Nigeria has taken on the level of debt that we haven't seen since the days of Abacha. Hmm. You know, um, I believe it was uh, when, after the return of, of democracy under President Olusegun Obasanjo, we had the debt recovery from the Paris Club. 
And I think we're back to those days now where we're going to be asking for debt, for, for debt forgiveness rather in a few years. <laughs> no, it's not funny, but I mean, why do we want to put ourselves in such situation uh, where we are vulnerable, if you like? Uh, well, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty much the same, the same pattern that has played out over and over in Nigeria where uh, we, are, we insist that oil revenues are enough to run a country of 180 million people. Mm. Um, I remember, I remember a few weeks ago on, on this station. In fact, it was although on a separate show called The Advocates, I spoke about the fact that um, the annual uh, income Nigeria makes from crude oil is not enough to run this country. I, I made the comparison with Egypt. That Egypt's 2020 federal government budget is the equivalent of 106 billion US dollars for 98 million people, hmm. while ours is just roughly $20 billion for 180 plus. plus million people. So when you do the math, ours, 200 plus now. Yeah, it <laughs> averages out to about $111 per Nigerian per year, while Egypt is about $1,000 per Egyptian per year. So and obviously, so obviously that, money, that revenue source is not enough. So instead of looking for ways to generate more income, which obviously means opening up the economy, mm -hmm and focusing on uh, tax from economic activity instead of you know, government-controlled enterprise, which seems to be the hill the Nigerian insists on dying on. We just have that single source, and then the only other thing we can do is take loans and aid. Mm -hmm. And that's where we are right now. Uh, hopefully, that's going to change. Uh, I'm not so sure whether that will happen on the... I mean, when is that going to change? Um, when, a, when an administration with a market-driven uh, policy outlook comes into power. I think the current administration has a very status-driven policy outlook, so I don't think that's going to change over the next three years. I think we're going to go into even more debt. Um, I think they're going to keep on trying to do what they're doing, which is basically uh, extract as much from the, crude oil, the shrinking crude oil revenue pie as they can, load on as much debt as possible, and try and pump it into infrastructure and hope that that will somehow, you know, magically germinate money when that's not really how it works. But All yeah, right. let's move on uh, from that in the interest of time. Uh, staying with the punch or moving to another? No, we're still staying with the punch. Uh, so um, you can just take another story from the punch newspaper. There's mixed reactions. Okay, mixed reactions persist. Mm -hmm. Concern eases as West African senior secondary certificate examination begins today. Begins today. Um, so. I'm not too familiar with what uh, measures have been taken to, like, since the coronavirus lockdown to make it such that students preparing for these exams actually finish their preparation. Mm -hmm. uh, I know schools have been closed down for, for months now. However, I did notice uh, a few days ago uh, when I was, I was walking around an area in Ikeja and I saw students walking around in school uniforms. Yeah, because they're, so, that's because they're back. I mean, the exit classes are back in school. You know, they were given two weeks to okay. come back before the exams, right. which many have argued. Uh, I'm not sure two weeks, you know, it's enough time for them to be able to catch up uh, we've had that conversation severally. And of course, um, Emeka Mwajuba, the uh, State uh, Minister for Health, says, no, it's enough time for them to prepare and that they will be OK. But I, I, I think it's only really their results that will say if time was enough for them uh, to be able to study, because they, they've been home for close to It's funny. Years. It's funny we mentioned this, because I remember seeing a news story late, late last night um, from Kenya and so the Kenyan uh, version of this exam was basically cancelled. Yeah. And Kenyan students have basically, uh, the Kenyan education ministry has basically hit the reset button and has cancelled this academic year. Yeah, it's the 2021, yeah. they're going to begin again afresh. I'm not so sure whether that's uh, that. A good we, thing in itself. You know, if we should have done that, but I, I just think it's an interesting experiment. You know, maybe they, because uh, I, I read the explanation, they said some students have been uh, privileged students have been attending classes via Zoom, online, online. Whatever. whereas the majority of students don't have access to such things. Mm -hmm. So that creates an imbalance and it's unfair. So then the solution was to wipe everything clean and start, start everyone in 2021. afresh. But um, if you also check it, isn't that the reality in Nigeria? Because there are some you know, elite um, children, yes. students who've been in school. A lot of all them this actually, well. yes. so, uh, Which is the question, part of the things we're saying here on several occasions that if you're asking all of these people will come back, 
right? Yes. The ones who've been studying and the ones who've not even seen their books. The, the state government here says, oh, they've been teaching them over the radio. I don't know how effective that is. You're going to put someone who's been studying and someone who's not been studying, and then we expect good results. How fair is that? It isn't fair, and again, I don't think there are any easy answers mm. to to this to this question. I'm not sure the Kenyan solution in it's itself is a good thing, but at the same time, there is clearly an imbalance here. So I I sit on the advisory board of Oxbridge Tutorial College, which is one of such schools, mm. and since April, when I believe the lockdown started, was it March? March. Students have been attending classes via Zoom, full interactive classes. There has been no break whatsoever mm. in the education because the school had the resources to make those things happen. But, mm. you know, the majority of Nigerian students, as we know, have no such facilities. Right. We're hearing stories about Lagos State Government trying to teach students via radio, via LTV. I'm not so sure how effective those, those things are. So, Again, I don't think there's any right or wrong as I think it's it's one of those things you just have to chalk up to an act of God, if mm. you like. You know, it's and hopefully, you know, it's the the uh, the white board finds a way to make it work for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. Just a quick word on that. Um, maybe this might be part of the solution. I remember seeing this in a story from the UK that um, their A level examinations were. I believe they cancelled this year as well. Yeah, so they were what, graded based on uh, the, exactly. whatever grade you had. Exactly, the, so they used, they used predicted grades. So again, I'm not so sure that would work in a Nigerian context, but it's just an idea to throw out. Maybe mm. that could be part of the solution. I mean, I honestly just want to say good luck to you know, um, the students who have to write their exams. Uh, what, what can we say that? Our prayers are with them, I guess. Absolutely. All right. So we, in the interest of time, David, we're going to take um, the Nation newspaper. We'll move okay. very quickly to the Nation newspaper. And the headlines uh, from the Nation newspaper as already displayed. Oh, that's, that, that's the headline you were talking about. Rains to pound Lagos <laughs> next month. Uh, that story is on page 42. Government uh, seeks cooperation. What sort of cooperation? Okay, we'll, we'll come to that. Mimiko uh, Karedolu wrote about Ajayi, and then fortunately something is not clear there. Um, but, uh, from police yeah, that, that's the, the 19 year old uh, who escapes from police custody. Manhunt begins. Why, why, why did he have to escape? Even, anyways, the story is on page six. And then we have the politics in Edo and Ondo. Ise Yamo promises more rules for monarchs. Uh, APC PDP in face of over printing of PVCs. Interesting. Uh, then we have apprehension as Jagede picks running mate, PDP governors not behind renegade. And that's uh, that story and more you have on page 12. Now we have the big story for the nation newspaper. Governors, lawmakers, others share 774,000 jobs. I believe that is that controversial, 774,000 job slots. Uh, 1,000 jobs per local government. Allocation formula. All right, it's there for you. So governors get 40 slots per local government. Uh, senators get 30 slots per local government. Reps get 25 slots. Uh, ministers get 30 slots. So who are those who are the ordinary person? Uh, uh, who represents the ordinary person and how does the ordinary person get his own if these lots are going to the big names as we're seeing all right we'll come to that ministers religious institutions and transport workers uh, women societies CSOs get slots um, okay October takeoff on cause uh, that's still on the matter I believe all right we go to CBN's stress test clears banks that's also on the front page Worship centers observe protocols in Ogun and Ekiti. I'm not sure whether this picture story quite represents observing the protocols. I, I stand to be corrected, but, but it is worrying what I'm seeing. Everyone is wearing a mask. So. <laughs> okay, so that, that's enough, is that? That should count for something. Okay, we will come to that. And then we have a WFT season farming, um, nestled to lift. 44,670 44, farmers and COVID-19 stories uh, table on page page four or page six. I believe that when you get a hard copy, you would find out for yourself. So, David, you, yeah. that, let's, let's talk about this picture story. Protocols, uh, safety measures. I've um, actually zoomed in on it. And okay. From what I can tell, mm -hmm. people are... They, it, 
if you zoom out, it looks like people are jammed together, but people are actually people actually have a two seat distance. Is that what it is? From each other. If you zoom in, you, you actually see that it's the perspective that makes it look like they're all small. But how about those behind? Those are the David. back. However, those who are standing yeah, seem the to since we're violating the protocol. So mm -hmm. yeah, you know, whichever church this is, might want to look into that. But yeah, um, so that's that, that's it's an what, attempt. It's an attempt to be safe, but not it's, exactly. Yeah, they're they're not quite getting it, but <laughs> you know. I mean, I, I believe that so many people raised the questions that um, we're not yet ready. But again, it seemed to be a very dicey situation to be. Do we want to say, oh, we should still be on lockdown? Or do we, life needs to continue? But I mean, <laughs> the, how the concept, do we strike a balance? You know, the concept of a total lockdown doesn't really work mm -hmm. in this. We have to move on one way or another. We really have to. Mm -hmm. And more, I think the data we have available shows that the projected death tolls, infection numbers and whatnot haven't happened here for whatever reason. We don't know why, but they simply haven't happened here. And maybe this is this this is one of those events where you don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Mm. Right? You take what has what you know, for once <laughs> you've been you've you know, nature has taken pity on you. Mm -hmm. You've been saved by grace. So, <laughs> you know, you, you take advantage of that and mm -hmm. you, you move on. You you can't really continue to close down the economy so right. because as i've said before nothing is deadlier than a broken economy in this part of the world you know not even a virus hmm. so eventually you know we will have to move on however the social distancing protocols and the safety protocols like wearing a mask those kind of things i think they should still they should remain in place for hmm. a while anything you know there is no such thing as being um, immune to it being too you know too safe yeah being you know. too safe i mean you know some in the earlier days people had uh, there was that argument that oh if you had covid and recovered uh, you, you are immune to it but i mean we know there are cases of people who tested once and retested and they have uh, covid so i mean if you have it before and then it does not mean that you can't get it so i agree with you that mm. yes we should keep to the protocols I, i'm i'm sorry we we'll have to move on <laughs> to another paper again in mm. the interest of time. Uh, we have uh, this day, if it will be displayed on the screen uh, for us to continue the conversation. But until it is displayed, uh, let's see what we can do with what we've got here. So um, this day says CBN BDC is to get dollars on resumption of international flights. The story is on the front page there. And then we also have I mean, regional security efforts vigilantes inimical to national safety IG wants and others uh, clam down on prohibited firearms. Groups rally support for NABBA over DSS invitation. And then we have Unilag Council gives details of Oguntipe's alleged financial misdemeanor. Uh, mis uh, that's on the front page also. Yeah, that's cool. It's been on the news. And then finally, uh, finally we have Buhari Lawan Jonathan Atiku felicitate with Babangida at 79. Oh, started. All right, uh, let me hand over to you again. I'm wondering um, what's catching your attention? Um. I mean, regional security outfits and vigilantes is inimical to national security, mm -hmm. IG warns. Um, I agree in principle uh, that in practice. ideally, mm -hmm. uh, only one, one uh, in the country like Nigeria, only the central government should have a, a monopoly of violence, ordinarily. However, I think um, over the past few years, we've seen that the Nigerian state's capacity to maintain that monopoly of violence has been severely degraded. It no longer exists. Mm. So if the Nigerian state no longer, if the Nigerian uh, central government, the federal government in Abuja no longer has the capacity to protect Nigerians across the country, then I'm not sure that the IG you know, has the moral standing. Mm. He might have the legal backing, obviously, but I don't think he has the moral standing to make this sort of claim anymore because if people are being killed in their houses, in their places of work, mm -hmm. in their farms, on the road, they're being kidnapped and there's insecurity and there seems to be no solution in sight, then, you know, and they have state governors, mm -hmm. then I, you know, if I was a state governor, I would feel like there's something that I had to do. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't just keep crying to Abuja, please come and save us and the help is, Abuja not, is, nowhere to the help is not forthcoming. Mm -hmm. So the IG himself, as well as his boss, at some point we need to review be, that be honest with themselves mm. and decide look do we want to tackle the problem of insecurity which by the way is not just like a northern problem anymore mm -hmm. it's now it's very much in the southwest now uh, it's in the niger delta as well 
you know, it's in the southeast too. Mm -hmm. You know, just and not as true. as highly publicized. So, um, are we going to deal with this issue, or are we going to decentralize the capacity to deal with this issue? Because one way or the other, the issue is going to have to be sorted out. The yeah. the only solution that is not possible is to leave things as they are. Mm. It's not feasible. Because I'm just wondering in my head uh, that why do we talk about state policing or you know states getting their own uh, kind of security outfits if I'm not saying they should be armed or not armed, but if they can't really honestly deliver, what use is it to have a uniformed man or woman who is not actually uh, practically giving you any safety or you know security? Exactly. Or I guess it's a question exactly. for you know for them to uh, take to respond or to answer. We hope that there will be answers to that. And then, yeah, shall we take another one story from Business. this day? This day, okay. Okay, uh, before we. Head off to the business day. The BDC is to get dollars on resumption of international flights. Mm -hmm. First of all, are you excited about the resumption of international flights? We don't have a date, but we are hopeful that <laughs> some people seem to be excited, so I don't know your position. I mean, I'm not excited because I have no plans to travel. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you're just indifferent. Anyways, yeah, if indifferent. it happens, okay. So what I am excited about is the reopening of the Enugu Airport, but that's another story, mm -hmm. anyway, which is supposed <laughs> to happen later this month. Um, the 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 real story for me here is the fact that you know the CBN is is rationing forex again, and every time this happens, we know that it's not a harbinger of something good. Um, we've been seeing stories over the past few weeks of banks refusing to let people withdraw their forex, and you know at every point in time, there's always that denial that no, there's no forex scarcity, everything is fine, you know. Mm. And you know, I'm not in the habit of saying that, you know. A naked emperor is wearing clothes, yeah. you know, because I believe if the emperor is naked, he should say so. Clearly, there's a forex scarcity. For whatever reason, the CBN is determined to pretend that there isn't. Uh, the the World Bank, I believe, has been very clear with the Nigerian government as to what it expects mm -hmm. Nigeria to do, which is unify the exchange rate. Right. And it has been stated times without number that when you unify the exchange rates, then the investment you are looking for, the forex, the forex investment will come into Nigeria. When investors feel confidence that the Naira is not overvalued, mm -hmm. they will put their money in. And that will ease whatever forex scarcity you have. But the Nigerian government is determined to continue fixing the price of the Naira artificially because it offers an opportunity for arbitrage. Mm -hmm. you know, and it, hopefully the, the, the the deteriorating fiscal position of Nigeria will make it such that at some point, whether we want to or not, we're going to have to do what the World Bank and to. the IMF said have said that we should do. They've been telling us to do this since the 80s, by mm -hmm. the way, and we've insisted that no, we need to overvalue the Naira. That's our na that's our national heel Mantra. to die on. That we must <laughs> overvalue the Naira. All right, I'm so. afraid we can't continue. I'm seeing that you're looking at uh, the other papers, but. This is where we're going to call it a wrap uh, on Off the Press. So thank you so very much, David, for being with me Thanks on the show. Thanks for having show. me. And remember that we continue to do this. Work.